Hello and welcome to Glasgow Doors Open Day's Digital Festival. This event will begin soon, but first we have a brief housekeeping message. So that you can get the most out of this session, we'd like to point out a few features of Zoom. By clicking on the buttons at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will be able to access the chat room, and if you are in a webinar, you will also be able to make use of the Q&A function. The Q&A function is so that you can ask specific questions of the speaker, which they will be able to answer time allowing at the end of the session. Use the chat room to contribute more generally to the discussion or to share links and resources. When using these features, please mind your P's and Q's. Both will be monitored and recorded. Most sessions will be recorded and uploaded to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival YouTube channel and website. If you're in a meeting, please make sure you keep your microphone on mute unless otherwise directed by the host. If for some reason the session ends unexpectedly or you lose connection, please just click the link again and wait to be let back in. Similarly, if the host loses connection, please bear with us. We will do our best to manage any connection issues as and when they occur and may contact you by email if necessary. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear about your experience of our digital festival. Fill out our survey to be in with a chance of winning a prize. Our survey is available at www.glasgowdoorsopendaysfestival.org.uk forward slash survey. We hope you enjoy this event. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the GIA's second three behind the prize event, which we are holding in conjunction with Glasgow Doors Open Day. Uh, my name is Sean McVicker and I'm the Vice President of the Glasgow Institute of Architects. So for those of you not familiar with us, the Glasgow Institute of Architects is a chapter of the Royal Institute Corporation of Architects of Scotland. We're the largest chapter in Scotland and we do a lot of work uh, in and around our chapter area, which is very wide reaching. Each year, we host the GIE Student Awards, which recognise the work of the very best architecture students across both of Glasgow's two schools of architecture. Awards are assessed by the GIE Council and the standards are always set very high. In the past, we held an award ceremony, but we created Behind the Prize as a platform to bring together the universities to discuss architecture, education and the built environment, but also really to celebrate the fantastic work of the students. And this year more than ever, given the difficult circumstances around which many of the students had to complete the academic year. By extension, we should use this opportunity to thank and congratulate the staff of universities for their efforts in this respect and also to you and them for pulling off the first digital degree shows for both schools in their histories. I really enjoyed engaging with this platform and looking at everybody's work. So thank you for that. And it's been really nice to see the wide range of student work. I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague Massimo, and he's going to explain a wee bit more about the format of the evening and introduce our speakers. Thank you, Shona. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second night of Behind the Prize. Um, so we're really happy to be able to put this event on, uh, despite the circumstances, the second year of this type of event. Um, I hope some of you were here on Monday, but I'll explain what's coming up, uh, if not. So the theme of tonight is the environment in me, um, which, as you'll see, like, applies in a few different ways to the speaker's projects. Um, the way we'll run the night is, so we'll have the student present their project and then have a couple of questions when they're done. So yeah, please don't hesitate to submit your questions in the chat box in the Q&A uh, and I'll read them out after. Um, so this event is really centred on like helping you students uh, and creating like a discussion on these people's projects is like a real plus of putting on an event like this. So, so yeah, please just ask as many as you want. Um, we've, got, we've got an hour really, so let's take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, here we go. Uh, without further ado, we have a, a great project by Art School third year Casper uh, Briska, um, who, with the theme, takes like, full advantage of the context uh, to suit the programme of his building. Um, so, Casper, if you like, start sharing your screen and unmute, we can uh, get the show on the road. So, yeah, sure. Just uh, one second, please.
Um, so, um, my third year project uh, at the Glasgow School of Art um, explored the relationship between architecture, landscape, and energy. The task was to develop accommodation and a venue for a music education charity, Systema Scotland, in the context of zero carbon strategy. Um, located on a strip of parkland along the banks of River Leven, in close proximity to the town center of Balog, the project aims to reconnect children from difficult family backgrounds with nature, seeking similarities between musical harmony, space, and the human body. The site of the project is a cross point of three axes, axis of journey, axis of escape, and axis of connection. The orientation of the buildings not only benefits from breathtaking views, but also as a part of environmental strategy. In order to achieve energy self-sufficiency, the buildings are based on a passive use of solar energy. On the ground floor, mostly communal areas and, place, and places to practice spread over the open floor plan. The spaces are flexible and adaptable, separated only by movable fabric curtains. Laid out in an east-west direction, the residential retreat is conceived as a sequence of vertical layers, starting from the most public and ending on the most private one. The southwest layer combines a vertical circulation with a number of informal, uh, inf uh, informal interior areas, which are perceived as dreamlike spaces with reference to Versailles or Orangerie, facilitating the ventilation of the larger communal areas on the ground floor. The performance hall is a double height columnar space and is connected with the residential building by the bridge, giving the inhabitants of the residency a unique access to the venue. Locating the bedrooms along the shore allows for the water to act as a natural boundary, providing the inhabitants of the retreat with necessary privacy and security. Uh, and enables the residents to benefit from the views on the lake and mountains. Due to the orientation of the building, the bedrooms receive a natural light in the morning. The void spread throughout the length and the height of the building, uh, finished with a south facing roof windows, act as light wells. They allow a flood of an unobstructed light that allow a natural light penetration far into the floor plan. The sun space serves several functions from a pleasant place of botanical discoveries to an environmental strategy device. It forms a buffer space able to capture the heat during winter and distribute the warm air into the open floor plan and the voids. Um, the flexible system of the partition walls within the cloisters gives the opportunity for every kid to feel comfortable in the residence. The rooms provide enough space for the instrument practice. Uh, in the circulation uh, area, the roof light enclosure, ceiling and some walls of the upper floors are painted white to strengthen the illumination by providing strong first reflections. The light reaches the timber paneling of the second and third floor and cast a warm glow through the bridges that lead the children to their flats. The venue is conceived more as a pavilion in the park rather, rather than a classic urban building, more like a roof protecting a public space. The skin of the building allows continuity between the structure and the park without giving up a certain privacy for the activities that take place inside. Seen from the outside during the day, the translucent skin of the building appears sculptural and does not make the immediate, immediate visual communication between the interior and exterior possible. At night, the situation is reversed and the interior becomes perceptible from outside. The polycarbonate skin 
allows the sun to penetrate the building, reaching the exposed ramped earth walls that surround the main event space. During winter, the thermal mass walls absorb the passive solar energy and slowly release their heat into the interior of the event space, reducing the heat demand. And finally, the primary structure of the venue accommodates the lightning and sound equipment. The secondary structure of the roof consists of thin and deep LVL beams. And thanks to their size and frequency, they bring a diffused sunlight into the space the whole year round. Um, I also prepared uh, an animation that, uh, that that tries to capture the relationship between the the outside and the inside of the buildings. Um, so let me uh, play it for you. Um, sorry, can you guys see the animation? Can anyone tell? Uh, yeah, sorry, we're just still seeing that last image of the um, oh, okay, okay. Uh, performance face. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, uh, okay. I think that's fine now. Yeah, that's us. Um, thank you for your attention. Oh, that was a uh, that was beautiful, Casper. That was I was amazing that uh, that animation. Um, thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, can I open the floor to the Q and A? If uh, if you guys just like start typing in some questions, uh, I can ask them to uh, Casper about his uh, about his project. Um, I'll kick things off though. Um, uh, yeah, I thought especially that animation. I thought that was just incredible. Got a real sense of place from it. Um, even though those are the type of oscillating images, I felt like I was on a wee boat feeling the, the kind of tide and the waves taking me there. That was, yeah, really great. 
Um, so yeah, I've got a couple of wee questions to start off. Um, so I noticed, like, if you go, can you share your screen again? Sorry, just to get uh, some yeah, images sure. up. Yeah, uh -huh. maybe of the of the plan. I, um, I noticed that the the way you kind of uh, laid out the building, you had a lot of the rooms facing the water. Um, was that uh, for a particular reason that you had kind of mostly like the private spaces facing the water? Was that so you know the people would have a more kind of private personal connection to to that view, um, rather than the kind of more communal like um, kind of spaces that you've got kind of more towards the the bottom of that plan? Um, so the problem of the site was that um, it's uh, it's a very public space and it's a park. Uh, it's like a national park. Um, so um, I decided to um, so like the street on the bottom is I suppose the most public uh, part and I, I wanted to spread out the, um, the functions of the room from the most public which would be from the street to the most private, which would be at the water. So like, as you can see, the concert hall is obviously the most public building and then goes into the accommodation. And um, yeah, like uh, there was a problem with, with the public, like keeping spaces more public and more, more private due to the nature of the site. And um, I just thought that um, the water edge like could be a good natural boundary for for inhabitants to have some privacy in, in the in their bedrooms. Oh uh, yeah, totally. That makes sense. Yeah, um, and yeah. I think the the kind of images you showed of like that um, that personal accommodation uh, kind of showed that off quite nicely, even with a little intermediary spaces for like they can kind of have a bit more um, kind of more personal connections with their with their neighbours. Thought so that was really nice. Um, uh, one wee point, uh, so yeah, um, you said that it was trying to be a very like environmentally friendly building. Um, uh, did yeah. you not want to try like um, incorporate the water into that strategy? Is it kind of maybe like a water source heat pump or something? Uh, yeah, like uh, that's also um, a part of the uh, of the design of the building, but um, I didn't really talk about it. Um, like obviously there's a water um, water source heat pump uh, and also um, I was thinking to use the like the water itself as an environmental strategy so um, like because the water for example during summer it warms up slow slower uh, than the outside so maybe like the the air from that is raising from the lake or, or the river can um, contribute to the cooling of the building. And the same in winter, like the water is usually warmer than, than the temperature outside. So it could contribute to the, to the heating of the, of the accommodation. Oh, great. I think that uh, almost answers, uh, I've got a question in the Q&A from uh, Bruce and he, he, he asked, given that it's placed in Balloch by the water's edge, what thought has there been if it rains and a lot of wind is blowing over the lock? Um, so I guess it is that you've you, know, you kind of answered that with the way of the kind of temperature of, uh, of that lock and how it kind of interacts with the building. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, looking at the last chance for any, uh, any questions, uh, might have to move on. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I think we'll just move on to the next one. Uh, thanks so much for that, Casper. That was uh, really amazing. Start, started off the night really well. Uh, so next up we have um, Strathclyde, Year 5, with Alexandra Adams and Ewan Campbell. Um, here they really typify tonight's theme um, and they can show what the future building could be with, uh, with the environment being at the forefront of the designer's mind. Um, yeah, if you guys want to go ahead and share your screen. Yeah, thanks Massimo. Uh... That come up okay? Yep, that's it. Great. Um, so myself and Ali have recently graduated from Strathclyde's architecture course, and today we're going to discuss our fifth year thesis, Growing Underground. Uh, the project focused on the issue of embodied carbon and material waste within the construction industry, and how the way we resource building materials can be improved. 
Looking to nature for inspiration, we began investigating how mycelium behaves within ecosystems, digesting waste material and converting this matter into nutrients, which are used for new growth cycles. Mycelium is the root structure of mushrooms, and the end result of this growth cycle is a natural material which boasts many properties which are advantageous to the construction industry. Through further research, this process of micro-remediation highlighted an opportunity for a new building material to be implemented within our architecture, which is entirely organic, performs well, and can decompose at the end of its life. Looking at how this material could be produced as a construction material, we looked at the abandoned network of tunnels and stations in the west end of Glasgow as the infrastructure for creating a production line. Fitting in with mycelium's growth cycles, reusing this infrastructure provided excellent conditions for mass cultivation of this material in a future context of the year 2045. Harnessing a local organic material to fuel the mycelium's growth, we looked at how coffee waste could provide this opportunity to, di to divert a man-made waste product from landfill. The process we then developed created a system which collected the waste material before processing it and feeding it with the mycelium to create the final building material. As part of refurbishing the dilapidated railway network, the former railway lines were developed to, to distribute this new mycelium building material. Due to the robust nature of this infrastructure, it provided a great opportunity to reuse these tunnels, which would otherwise have fallen into disrepair. Creating a programme for these interventions, which would, would facilitate this growth process, one of the main areas of testing looked at how nature could be integrated within the buildings, creating a connection between the inside and the outside. The aim of this was to highlight the impact that nature has on our lives and how it can improve the spaces in which we live and work in. The first of the three sites on the master plan was Kirkley. Kirkley is a former railway station site which was designed to facilitate the research and development aspects of this proposal. Creating these secondary spaces for research, education and testing, the primary function of Kirkley was to provide a method for collecting and filtering rainwater for use within the growth process. The courtyard and water tower are centred on the axis of the disused railway line with the secondary spaces offset from this axis to create a connection with the main function of the site and the significance of the site's railway heritage. The water tower itself uses the process of aeration to naturally filter the rainwater before storing it in tanks to be used for irrigation as well as the secondary services of the building in order for it to be self-sufficient with the minimal impact on the environment. Whilst there is a functional purpose to the water filtration process, the tower provided an opportunity to create a feature of this at the centre of the building. In this calm courtyard environment, the occasion of the cascading water created a space for visitors to observe the process, as well as providing one of many points to interact and engage along this production line. As well as the water aeration tower, the secondary spaces surrounding the Kirkley site provide a more intimate setting for these environmentally conscious materials to be showcased. The materials library provides an exhibition space for education and the display of the mycelium material, both in the content of an exhibition as well as within the material buildup of the space itself. The prototyping space at Kirkley provides a double height area for large scale mock ups of mycelium construction components to be developed and tested. Whilst our research identified mycelium to have suitable applications in construction, the brief required these spaces to allow for further advancement of this new technology. The Botanics is a unique site which allowed for the reuse of the existing station and platform to create an industrial double height space which play with light and shadow and find a balance between process and community involvement. The existing infrastructure allowed for a play on above and below ground, repurposing the tunnel and limiting environmental impacts through the reuse of existing embodied energy. The purpose of the site is for the collection and pasteurisation of the substrate for the mycelium to bind to, which was carefully considered and coffee waste was selected. The wild variety of plants and flowers that grow in Scotland allow for gardens of green and purple tones to encourage the biodiversity of the area allowing long grass to grow and discouraging people disturbing these areas and using other parts of the gardens instead, encourages creatures, birds and bees to inhabit these areas and keep these ecosystems thriving. 
Due to the length of time the railway has remained disused, nature has begun to reclaim the site and we wish to allow nature to grow within and surround the buildings in a controlled way to pay homage to the stage of the railway's history. The wild garden acts as a buffer between the busy intersection of Great Western and Byers Road and the pavilion. The urban location allows for the collection of coffee waste from the surrounding cafes and restaurants to act as a substrate for the growth process. The coffee shop inside the pavilion allows for additional coffee waste recycling. The repeated structure encapsulates the existing structure, both preserving and repurposing the station. The louvers filter light into the building through an additional layer of tree canopy, creating a hierarchy of light into the double height spaces. The process continues underground with the inoculation of the mycelium and coffee waste into the moulds. The mycelium requires dark, humid and moist conditions which lend itself to growth within the tunnel. The moulds then travel under Great Western Road over a four week time period, reducing the competition for space in an urban area whilst utilising an otherwise derelict space. The moulds then arrive at the final building at Kelvin Bridge Station. This building is used as a distribution hub, first removing the mycelium and baking the product to seeth growth, after which the final product is ready for transportation. The building mimics the geometry of the shunting yards which stood before it, feeding into the wider context and paying homage to its past. The building's surrounding landscape gives the building unique opportunities to play with scale and form. The double height prototyping space allows for the finished product to be tested and displayed to be used for quality control and testing with space for viewing at different levels. We'd like to thank the, thank the GIA for organising this event and appreciate being given the opportunity to talk about this thesis project. Our full project can be found on issue under the title Growing Underground. That was great guys. Oh, really, that was such a good project. Really interesting stuff. Um, yeah, again, uh, any questions, get them coming in. Um, and like ask, yeah, ask more about this like really interesting project and love just the ideas of like reuse and, and kind of not letting anything go to waste, even from infrastructure to coffee grounds. That was, yeah, so good. Um, couple, uh, I'll start things off again, couple of wee questions. Um, so yeah, I loved that actually, the reuse of the buildings is a sense of like conservation. Um, and I thought it was actually quite funny using the old tunnel infrastructure uh, because I went hearing something about how they tried to like make um, a slime like grow and try to analyse it and they put it on a map of Japan and it actually went the exact same way as the Japanese subway station. That's how it grew. It's been like a really efficient way. Um, so I thought it was like, quite a funny wee anecdote and to use that uh, existing infrastructure to grow the mycelium. Yeah, kind of makes sense. Um, so the, you showed a picture at the start of the kind of block, the proposed block of mycelium. Did you uh, ever try like making that or is that just like Photoshop there? Um, that's, that's our uh, mycelium block that we grew ourselves and we grew that um, this time last year. Uh, it took us about six weeks to grow that block specifically. We were growing it from our flats, which wasn't the best conditions for it. So in a more controlled environment, it would only take around four weeks. But um, yeah, that is one of the blocks that we made, which is like the st standard size of a uh, brick that you would uh, build with. Oh, wow. Um, I guess that must have just given you such a greater insight into actually the project. Like did that, um, as, you, as you were doing that, did that kind of alter the way you approached it? Or did you guys already have a good idea of how this block was going to be used? and? kind of fabricated? We had a fairly good idea, but when we were sort of conducting this research, we, we sort of decided to experiment by growing it ourselves. Um, and I think it definitely helped us develop a brief in terms of when we were trying to work out how, how the brief would look in terms of what we needed to meet. I think that was a really useful exercise in doing that, getting to understand the environmental conditions that the building would need to perform to, um, we spoke about why we used the used the railway tunnels to create the right uh, conditions in terms of a dark, humid space. We were then able to take from our research and we were able to apply that to our brief. Looking at um, the reason that we picked the tunnels was um, we found another project that was actually based in London in the um, in like a um, a bunker that was built um, and they now use that to grow 
fresh like veg and like it's mostly like um, leaves and things like that um, and then they sell them it sell it within London and um, but for that project they need a lot of um, artificial sunlight and things like that because it's done underground whereas um, the mycelium doesn't photosynthesize so it doesn't need sunlight in the same way so we could use the same sort of idea but it would have less environmental uh, demands because you don't need to create this sort of um, false sunlight for um, the uh, product to grow. Yeah, I've actually seen that project and I saw like, a little interview with it and everyone had to wear like hazmat suits not to like contaminate the, the interior. So I think it's, your project works so well because it has that kind of community integration as well. And it seems that like you could like peek down into it and see it getting getting grown. Um, one question I had was like the, was there any mushrooms actually growing in the, in the tunnels? Like would that alter like that, like make a different colour of like the blocks and if it was taken to different like disused railway stations that could like alter the kind of architecture or the the look of each each uh, intervention yeah i'm sure it could uh we when we went to view the site um i think glasgow city council have done a really good job at making it really difficult to get into the abandoned railway uh, stations <laughs> um so we were able to get fairly close but we weren't actually able to get into the Botanics railway station, for example, although I have seen uh, some photographers who have managed to get in recently during lockdown. Um, but I think it's just such a really interesting space that's right in the center of Glasgow. Um, and I think that's one of the aims of the project was to try and take a space which has been completely forgotten and nature's kind of taken back th that space and to try and work with nature to create something which works towards improving the environmental situation that we find ourselves in at the moment in terms oh, of the, totally yeah oh sorry there you go um, in terms of the um changing the color and like the properties of the brick um the mycelium is almost like the glue that binds whatever substrate um it combines with so in this case we used coffee waste which would change um the color of it in that picture we hadn't selected coffee waste at that point so that's using straw um, but the coffee waste would obviously change the colour of the mycelium. So depending on what your substrate is, that is what changes the properties of the mycelium brick. So um, that's mm. the, it's a white, um, yeah, it's like a white mushroomy uh, texture which grows, but it's more the substrate that would uh, define those characteristics. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Oh, well, I think you guys have done a really good job. That was like a really successful project. Yeah, just again, reusing that kind of old infrastructure and yeah, somewhere that you just kind of walk past so often and kind of update it with such a kind of forward thinking uh, brief and uh, programme. Yeah, really, really loved it, guys. Um, I think we'll be moving on to the last uh, last speaker of the night. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, last but not least, we have uh, Jacob Young uh, at Strathclyde, uh, Strathclyde's second year. Um, and he represents the theme a bit differently. Um, it's a bit more how the environment poses opportunities as a, as a kind of question of identity and how that relates to its users and site. Um, so yeah, on you go, Jacob. Great. All right, okay, uh, with me. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Hope you've been enjoying the session. Uh, my name's Jacob Young. And I'm going to be taking you through my second year architecture design uh, project, which was for a study library in St. Andrews. Uh, so what does it mean to be Scottish? The people, the culture, not being English? This is a question I tried to answer throughout my design project. And for me personally, when designing um, architecture, I feel like the context is really key. And um, as well as that, also the people who's going to be using the type of building. So for this project, I decided to look at St. Andrews through the filter of national identity um, and really understand how Scottish St. Andrews is as a town. Uh, this is quite important to me for kind of two different reasons. Um, as you can tell, I'm not Scottish, I'm English. And I came here two years ago and I found it a little bit of a culture shock coming to Scotland and especially the kind of um, the patriotic uh, values of of Scotland has for their nation, which you don't really have so much in England, or I, I feel like I, I haven't really seen that. And then for the second one, I thought it was quite apt in the current political environment. Um, 
especially with the 2019 election and the, the kind of current situation with um, Nicola Sturgeon and the possible referendum for, for uh, uh, the, the second referendum for independence. So I thought this was kind of the opportunity to explore Scotland a little bit further. So kind of looking around St Andrews, um, you've got these kind of like Scottish cues, which when you start looking for them, it's quite, quite interesting. One of which is a Scottish baronial architecture with its kind of iconic turrets and its uh, crow step gables. And this architecture is often kind of placed in these little kind of twisting and winding cobble streets and um, with kind of big stone heavy uh, facades with kind of this punctured irregular fenestration. As well as that, um, when you kind of look at the details, you start to see like Scottish imagery all over the town, such as these kind of Scottish thistles, which are kind of based on planters. And this is something which I really wanted to incorporate into my design and create almost a kind of Scottish collage for this uh, library. So the site itself is quite tight and it kind of bases itself between Market Street, which um, I identified as kind of like the commercial hub of St Andrews, and then North Street, which is kind of like the residential area. So one thing which I identified with this kind of uh, route passage between North Street and Market Street, and that these kind of two main streets become anchor points. And what I really wanted to do was create a library which kind of interacts with the traveling from point A to point B. Um, but after looking at the site, there was some kind of initial problems. One being that it's very vehicle heavy at the moment. The kind of pedestrian passage and lane is only uh, a single way and it kind of, it's quite restricting, so I wanted to look at giving space back to uh, St Andrews and creating this kind of green space as park, which allows people to kind of stop and wait for a while. The main exterior of the library itself, like I said, kind of takes cue from um, these punctured facades, which I've seen. Uh, but instead of just seeing them as windows, I wanted to look at them as kind of uh, solid and void spaces. And I wondered what it would be like if instead of it just being a void as a window, you kind of pulled out these um, contemporary boffy s reading pods. And um, so these are kind of like little private areas where you can kind of go away and uh, read a book and study, and it's kind of away from the library. And the decision for where to place these pods and the landscape was really kind of heavily inspired by the Highlands. What I really wanted to do is kind of get the nature and this kind of national, um, kind of like national flowers and just the nature really and put it into this kind of public landscape. Uh, what I didn't quite realise at the time is how difficult it is to try and replicate the highlands and probably the flattest site you'll ever see. Uh, another big uh, aspect of the design was kind of materiality and looking for sustainable national materials. Um, such as Scots Pine, which kind of worked in two senses. It worked with a the theme of national identity and kind of Scottishness, but as well, it kind of, um, it's locally sourced. It's got low embodied energy because you can kind of source it uh, quite nearby. And as well as looking at materials, I also wanted to look at, well, how can we use unconventional construction methods in a sustainable way? And um, it's quite interesting, actually, when looking at the form, I was looking at um, kind of Scottish castles and it's got a big mass of uh, big stone buildings with about meter thick walls. So I wanted to get the form of these castles and the thickness of the walls, but also it was important for me to address the kind of environmental ethos of the future. So using hay bale construction gave you that thickness, but also the kind of benefit to the environment. When cladding uh, the hay bale walls, I didn't really want to use just kind of plain white render. I wanted to enhance uh, this kind of, this wall and enhance the sensors. So what I did was got models of plaster and embedded kind of Scottish thistles into it. So you can imagine walking along the library and rubbing your hand across this wall and kind of feeling the kind of that Scottish energy within you. As we kind of delve into the, into the building and the ground floor plan, uh, we can see kind of how tight this rectangular plan is. So one of the key uh, things I had to take into consideration is how can we make space more efficient? Um, can we place kind of bookshelves underneath seating? And in this case, uh, can we like move the reception and move the staircase, which kind of solves a lot of issues to do with circulation, but also be greeted at the entrance. 
Uh, one of my kind of precedents I looked at was um, Macintosh in his Glasgow School of Art. And when looking at his rooms, it kind of it really brings to life the idea that form follows function. So rather than a lecture room be this kind of box where you kind of take out seats and speak, how can the architecture really elevate that experience? How can you direct uh, someone's attention? And this is something which I try to kind of carry through the building. As well as that, um, kind of looking, taking the ideas from the exterior to the interior. So when you have a transient space, how can we like uh, enhance them and allow people to stop and wait for a while? So I created these kind of little reading nooks and corridors to allow people to kind of meet with their friends, uh, to allow social activity, or even just for people if they want to read a book by themselves away from everything, it's an area where they can go to. Um, so this next one was kind of looking at uh, how can we how can we represent architecture as kind of like theatre and how can it be like a cue for Scotland's past? So um, for the archive, for example, this kind of came to mind when again, when I was looking at these Scottish castles and I was looking at this beautiful barrel vaulted cellar in a, in a, in a castle and I had a little bit of light at the end and I thought this is the kind of exact atmospheric qualities I'd want for an archive. And you can imagine kind of picking up this like really old book and blowing the dust off and then opening it and then kind of learning about the castles but while being in that contemporary environment that kind of nods to the past which I thought was quite interesting and as well as that um, as well as the archive the kind of main entrance hall kind of represents out of like a palace entrance hall and where you've got a gallery above and maybe like kind of a picture of the king but instead up here you've got this kind of coffee shop style learning environment where people can sit around looking over the balcony and really this space is about kind of it's about being open and loud and talking and it's about learning by socializing and uh, this was kind of the first step of three main learning environments which we wanted wanted to adapt within the uh, library i think one of the kind of key issues with uh, learning environments at the moment particularly schools is everyone learns in a different way and learns in um, different environments which works best for them. So I wanted to create a library that works for all, three, uh, all of these kind of different environments. So the next kind of uh, learning area is almost like focused learning. It's a bit quieter and more enclosed and I wanted to achieve this architecturally by kind of having it only accessible by bridges. It's away from the hustle and bustle, it's away from the noise and it kind of allows you to concentrate a little bit more. So as you've got the kind of open social learning you've then got the focused learning which is currently accessible by bridges and then the last one was kind of private learning which again reflect relates back to the the pods and it's almost been pulled away from the library pulled away from all the other learning you kind of ingrained yourself into nature where you can kind of hide away in your own private study pod so hopefully you enjoyed my response to a scottish library but equally if you hated it Good, I'm only English after all. For me, the project became more than designing a building. It made me question my values, identity, and the place I call home. Thank you. Oh, that was great, Jacob. That was so, so good. Um, Thank you. I'm on, I'm on holiday right now, and that's made me shed like a Scottish tear. I'm loving it. <laughs> um, I, I love, like, love the confidence of like someone that's yeah, not from Scotland trying to tackle that subject that's like a really difficult thing to do so like and you've I think you've done it really well like congrats um, like yeah again uh, opening up the questions if anyone want, any Scottish people want to give uh, Jacob an earful this is your chance yeah <laughs> um, yeah I'll kick things off again um, so I really liked the idea of um, basically bringing that identity through like so many different layers of the project um, I think, can you go back to the picture of the, um, the like the wall build-ups? The, the, oh, this? Yeah, just like quite the start, yeah. That yeah, one. I thought even that was like, this was like quite an effective, like way of bringing that original theme right through to like kind of every part of the project. Um, yeah. I mean, I think even that, like that type of a uh, very thick, heavy wall build-up kind of correlates with like the history of uh, Scottish architecture, not even like reflects like 
you know, a strong-minded Scottish mentality. But I was, yeah, like really good, kind of, I think really good kind of point. I think there's okay. a lot of like different metaphors you can like bring from that. I um, think, I mean, particularly with the kind of the straw bales, it's quite interesting when, I mean, we're kind of dwelling into like a culture so rich as the kind of Scottish culture. It's because you've kind of got the element of time where stuff changes kind of naturally. So you're kind of battling, well, how can we reflect the past and the culture behind, but then also look to the future of what Scotland's moving forward? So I felt like the kind of the straw bells somewhat worked in that extent. Um, but I don't know, I thought it was, it was an interesting question, which I don't think I've quite answered totally, but it was something which I quite enjoyed looking at and learning through on the way. No, no, I think you've done really well with that. Um, another wee thing I've uh, kind of tried to think about was um, you've explored the process of like getting a book really well and even like the different experiences and different types of spaces that it, um, it requires. Yeah, I love that idea of taking that dusty book and you've just got that slither of light from a, like, from a castle window. I thought it was really good. Yeah, um, thank you. Did the different type of spaces, did you think, like, correlate to different type of identity as well? Or was that, um, you were fine just with a kind of more exterior type approach to it, and then you had to get to the nitty gritty of an actual library in the interior? I mean, I think it kind of, it almost worked to both at the same time, like, when, when developing it, it was kind of, you have to keep the function in mind at heart, it has to be like a working library and the spaces have to work for it. But at the same time, like, it's like, how can we then have the opportunity to um, like play around with the form? And I think uh, a lot of help was given, but when looking at like Macintosh's work, so uh, this kind of entrance hall, mm. that kind of, it, it, that almost felt like, um, it, it, like Macintosh's library in the Glasgow School of Art took a lot of kind of inspiration for that. And I think, but then looking at, at Macintosh's work, I feel like when he designed a lot of this stuff, he, um, he looked at the kind of the existing stuff within Scotland, so the castles and the palaces and stuff like that, and creating his contemporary twist, which he's obviously done really well because I mean, it, it's Macintosh, but... Um, <laughs> It was something which I kind of almost wanted to recreate in a way. Oh, definitely. No, I think it's like, yeah, really successful, like an entrance space and that uh, kind of larger um, kind of meeting, reading area. Um, got a wee question from uh, Bruce coming through. Um, yeah. He goes, uh, I like the idea, but uh, how accessible is this building and the pods? Um, with the stairs and bridges, can wheelchairs users access it? Um, and the um, pods seem to have a lip to step over. Yeah, so the the stairs in the building itself does have um, what's it called. There is a lift in the building, and the bridges are accessible for wheelchair users. Of um, well, me measured them out, so hopefully they are. Uh, the pods itself, it kind of varies. I've, I've tried to incorporate in the exterior landscape. There's both staircases to kind of get up the levels, but also ramps and. Certain pods have got lips, but uh, other pods also don't. It's kind of built in. It just depends on which way the landscape's built in. Oh, okay, nice one. Um, yeah, kind of last, last chance for any other questions. Um, any minute. Uh, yeah, if not, I just want to say thanks so much for all the speakers, guys. I thought you've done so well today. I uh, really loved all your all your presentations. Um, for the second night, I think you have done like so so well. Um, I want to say thanks again to Tours Open Day for helping arrange it, um, and also just like keep in mind that on Friday we've got the third and last instalment. Um, so hope you guys all can come along. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, guys, and yeah, see you Friday.